But what we've seen these last few years where the stuff that, you know, when we used to get together at our conferences and talk to each other and we used to say, this is where the left's going to ultimately go if we don't do blank, if we don't stop this, you know, this stuff's all now happening right now in real time. And I am just fascinated by the notion of that, that you believe the antidote is to play by some, you know, archaic set of unwritten rules. Like let's put let's, you, you and I are both sports fans. Let's make a sports analogy here. Okay. Let's bring in major league baseball, which I think is a good an, an analogy for the politic, the way the political conservative world works. Cause it's a sport built on unwritten rules, traditions, uh, those sorts of things. Okay. So you're out there, you're out there losing your mind about the, about unwritten rules of the kangaroo court and your dugout. Meanwhile, the other pitcher with the camera on is, is scuffling the ball with a razor blade. The, the umpire is watching them do it, doing nothing about it. Actually, when he drops his razor blade, the umpire, see that is the federal judge, walks out to the mound, hands him another razor blade and says, hey, in case you drop this, you know, I mean, keep scuffling the ball. They get to cheat as much as they want. And meanwhile, you're in your own dugout arguing about, you know, well, you know, you're, you're supposed to put the bat right down and not admire your home run. You see where I'm getting with this? That seems to be what French is arguing to me. What am I missing? Yeah, I don't think you're missing a whole lot. I mean, now look, in the founding era vision, obviously the states were supreme. Madison tells us in Federalist 45 that the powers delegated to the federal government are few and far between. The powers left to the states are numerous and indefinite. Um, the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment is actually a very good example. The original meaning of the Establishment Clause was not to say like you can't pray in public, obviously. It was to allow each state to establish its own church. But what I'm getting at, actually, is that that entire vision of this kind of like federalist, lowercase f federalist, live and let live vision was predicated on a basic set of yes. shared morals, yep. traits and customs. I yep. mean, John Adams, it's a very famous quote. The Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. Mm -hmm. It was it is inadequate for anyone else. What happened over the next 150, 200 years, really escalating, obviously, after Woodrow Wilson and FDR and really with the rise of the new left since the 1960s, even even more so. And then the new new left in the 21st century, obviously, is we have lost any semblance of mm -hmm. that shared morality, customs and traits. And what happens is, as you know, are these unspoken traditions, these unwritten rules have just been decisively eroded. And they've been eroded so much so that if our side's response is to retreat to procedural nuances and simply say, uh, you know, like, uh, what are we doing here? Like, live and let live. I mean, our, our, our live and let live message, Steve. That, that might have had political valence in the early 19th to mid 19th century, perhaps, is utterly unpersuadable and feckless when our enemy, again, literally wants to drive us out yes, of existence. Yes, that's, ex that's exactly right. And see, I, I'm, I, I don't buy, I, I, having read David's work for years, he is a conservative. And I resent this idea that depending on your views on Donald Trump in any given day determines whether you're a conservative or not. All right, I, I, I push back against that with maximum prejudice. What, I, what I'm trying to get people like him to understand like Bill Crystal was never a conservative, okay? But what I'm trying to get somebody like David French to understand is that if you don't, David, if you don't get the point, the, the DEFCON 1 status that we are at right now as a culture, and if you don't get why people are at, the, at, are at an existential angst breaking point, tipping point right now, Boy, if you, if, if you don't like Don, Donald Trump's particular peccadilloes and his particular uh, shady areas and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the red that's in his moral ledger, People will turn to increasingly more desperate figures that speak to their angst when folks like you will not. And I've used this analogy before. I, I used this analogy to Ted Cruz during the campaign about the rise of Trump. People would prefer that the Gary Cooper sheriff, the nice guy, saved the town from the banditos. But if the Gary Cooper sheriff will not empty the chamber... And, and have smoke coming out of his revolver with a pile of bodies to show them that they're not, it's safe to come out now. When, when Clint Eastwood rides in, nee, 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 nee. when he rides in on a pale, when the pale rider rides in, yeah, you know there's going to be some collateral damage and it, it, it's probably going to make more of a mess than needs to be made, but you also know all of the bad guys are going to be dead. And if folks like French do not figure this out, then they're going to they're helping to create the dynamic where people are going to turn increasingly more to provocateurs that speak to their concerns like this, Josh. 
Yeah, I think that's exceedingly well said. Um, to tie back a little bit to, a, to the tweet that I think you, that, you, that you were referencing at, at the beginning that I said about this debate, here's how I see it. Some people view the pursuit of liberty as kind of the ultimate intrinsic good, mm-hmm. right? And to, and, to be, and to be clear, the Declaration of Independence, like very clearly says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that men are entitled to you know, natural rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Liberty was very important. But liberty, by definition, cannot, is not, and must not be the end-all, be-all of why we establish governments. Uh, no serious political thinker other than Ayn Rand, I think, has ever thought that, going back to antiquity, the Greeks, Romans, uh, Jewish, Christian thought, any of it. Um, it, it has always been thought of something as greater than that, because what what is endless liberty run amok? I mean, take that to its logical conclusion. There is an endless stream of writings from the American founding fathers talking about how licentiousness and personal vice would ultimately be societally ruinous. Um, and, and, you know, and, you know, back in the original kind of like uh, post uh, Bill Buckley, National Review, Frank Meyer kind of fusionist consensus, they did talk a lot about this. But I think what happened is even within like conservatism, Inc., so to speak, within the conservative fold, a lot of this talk has just died. And the emphasis has just become overwhelmingly on the pursuit of liberty above all else. But again, that just cannot be right. There has to be something ahead of that. So I, I think what the Amari side of this debate is saying is that ultimately you take it back to Aristotle, who talked about the pursuit of human flourishing, mm-hmm. uh, right? I mean, that was really the term that that, that he used in the Greek. And it, it, that really does mean the pursuit of the common good and ultimately the highest good. And we can debate to the end of time what exactly that means. But um, kind of retreating to procedural nuances, to Fourth, Fifth, Sixth Amendment protections, um, this is just, it, it is an inadequate remedy to the current crisis of civilization that the right faces and being so under siege by a revanchist left. 